sound, a group of vibrators. From the beginner to the professional, from the novice to the master, from playing around, experimenting with things to create a masterpiece. These are all the elements of art. And on this show, the art is sound. Hi, L.V. Smith here, rocking in his 13th year. Now, I'm going to go back to memory lane because something very profound hit me in this thing. I went on Facebook one, Facebook one time, and I saw this, this cat here tearing up on a Hammond organ. I mean, he was doing things I just not ever thought possible. And then I wrote comments like, hey, I really like your stuff. And we started talking. And next thing I know, uh, I was going to his concerts. And I said, dude, you're going to win downbeat. <laughs> Jazz organist of the year, man. He goes, no, 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 it won't happen. Well, guess what? It's not often do I get a guy to come back, but to come back as Downbeat's number one jazz organist. And I'm speaking of Brian Charette. Welcome back, my brother. I didn't even think you would come back. Here he is. The Hi, most humblest man in the world. LV, the I have to I have to say that I'm the number two um organist in the 2023 downbeat critics poll behind our dear friend joseph d francesco that just left us <sighs> that is true he left us yes yes he yeah, was but... number one but this is 2024 you will have to embrace that crown well we have to see we don't know yet we don't know yet it may be somebody else well i have you today number one yeah <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Extremely happy, man. Now, you were here back then with the, all the COVID stuff, they, and your hammer wasn't available, and but you gave a great piano concert, by the way. It was, uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. and, um, and I'm going to tell you something else about this guy here, Brian. He's not only in the jazz world, but he does classical organ. He's invited to travel. Now, playing these great cathedrals, what these classic instruments are. Ed, you got to tell us about that someday. I can tell you about it now if you want. Um, yeah, give us a taste. Yeah. Well, beautiful old church there. And we were playing Franz Liszt music. We played a mass called Via Crucis. And I was actually playing B3, but I was like du dueling with the pipe organist. Wow. So so that pipe was, organ and a B3. Now yes, that's an exchange. Yes. And one other thing that I, you know, I played not as much as I do now, but 12 years ago, I played in three Catholic churches in New York, pipe organ for masses. Um, and I actually got to play an organ in Friedberg, Germany, that Bach played, made by a very <sighs> famous organ maker named Silberman. Have you ever heard of Silberman organs? Yes, I saw. It. Is that the one with the reverse keys? Uh, some of them. This one did have that where the where the white keys are, are black and the black keys are white. This was like that. But there are there are many like that, but not maybe necessarily only his organs. But he was maybe one of the most famous organ makers. What is that? 300 years ago or 350 <sighs> years ago. So I got to play one of those organs. I went to the museum. You know, people. They have a wind machine now, but in the old days, people would be in there running to pump the air, just like a, a what is that called? You know, the rat, the uh, the wheel. Do you know when they put a little mouse on the wheel and he's chasing the Oh, the treadmill. Yes. This is what's going on to pump the air for pipe organs 350 years ago. It's really incredible. And they would have to use these most unbelievable cranes to get the stuff in there i don't know if you've ever seen like medieval cranes but they're you know amazing engineering um okay. again with people as counterweights so uh very interesting to see how these instruments were built pipe organs anyway that is whoa so profound i mean i thought it was just a couple of people pumping bellows but here they're on a treadmill it can be it depends um, some are more complicated than others, you know. Um, yeah. The big ones had, you know, fairly advanced apparatus be behind it, especially if they had a lot of pipes. That's a lot of wind, you know. Yeah. Yeah. All, I would almost think that all of them had to have somebody pumping the wind. 
because there was no kind of electricity, you know, mm-hmm. there was nothing like that pumping the wind. So I think it had to be propelled, you know. Yeah, definitely. Well, we're going to jump into the present. Okay. And um, and um, I noticed that you do free concerts. I mean, they are free on Facebook. On Tuesdays, I do. Yes. Every, well, this started during the pandemic also. You know, we weren't going anywhere. And I started to mm-hmm. do a stream every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. And I just kept on doing it. And now I've done hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, and, you know, I have some fans that watch it and, uh, it usually gets a lot of interest after, and I put them on YouTube and it's very fun for me. And I think you were talking about downbeat. The thing that I did win this year was rising star keyboard number one. And I think that was completely because of the stream, um, Mm -hmm. because I play synthesizers and drum machines. And I'm basically performing my music live with these instruments, which is very different than the Hammond organ, obviously. Yeah, and we could talk about that later mm-hmm. on. But let's hear a little bit of uh, some of this streaming. For, is it called Electronica? It's called Tuesday Night Electronica. Tuesday Night Electronica with Brian Charette. Roll that clip. Yeah. Smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today.
Tuesday night electronica. Let's see who's looking in. Wow. That is totally so impressive. I mean, and we get to hear this every Tuesday night, right, Brian? Yes. Yeah. I mean, different pieces of music always. This is a piece from an album called Like the Sun, but I, I do sometimes electronic versions of my jazz music. Sometimes I compose music for that night. It's always whatever I'm working on, you know. And I'm I'm playing everything live, so it's kind of all, it's the only way to hear, like, all me, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you like that. Wow. <laughs> The total package, man. I, I love all of you, man. I, I, I definitely do. <laughs> Me too. Maybe too much. <laughs> Never enough. Never enough. Now, I like you listening were... to that music just now. I'm loving it, man. Now, um, in today's technology, I always likened the uh, Hammond organ to a crude synthesizer, but you said it's actually, I don't want to say it's the first synthesizer, but it is kind of the first modern synthesizer. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And would you explain how they are different compared to today's uh, electronic sure. instruments? Well, let me do the whole, I'll try to quickly summarize. The first synthesizers are coming out. I'm pretty sure in the 1800s, maybe they had them in the 1700s, but these instruments called Anders Martineau, which uh, Olivier Messiaen used, and they were these huge, huge machines. Tesla made some weird stuff. Um, so the origin, the first electronic instruments were quite a while ago. Lorenz Hammond in 1929. Lorenz Hammond was a clockmaker, so was making clocks. And then he made this instrument, some kind of recording wire, recording player. I'm not sure what the name of that was, but it was Hammond's first product. In 1929, he came out with the Hammond's organ, which was supposed to be an alternative to the pipe organ, which we were talking about before. Um, it became very popular, found its way into jazz and popular music as the years go on. Um, and is very similar to the works of a clock inside. The sound of a Hammond is made by something called a tone wheel spinning in front of a magnet. And there are nine draw bars that control different fundamentals um, of the pitch. Uh, and as you pull draw bars out, har uh, overtones are added in the harmonic series, making it fatter. Okay, so this is 1929. Hammond has its heyday maybe in the mid-50s with Jimmy Smith who comes along in 1955. Um, now there's very many modern organists. It's in a lot of rock music in the 60s. Synthesizers kind of come around. Maybe 1970 is the first Moog synthesizer. I'm not expert about these dates, but these are the first analog synthesizers, which are also with electricity, but lots of filters and circuits. Um, Bob, Bob Moog is kind of the guy credited with inventing all of this technology. And the reason that there are different synthesizer companies is because the only thing that Bob Moog patented was the ladder filter. He made all of this other technology free to everyone. And then came Oberheim, Roland, and Sonic, and on and on. And that's how we come to the modern synthesizers of today. How'd I do? You did great. I remember <laughs> listening to Bob Moog, though, in 67, 68. With that's a synthesizer? I, yeah, that's when he, okay. when he could play one note. But that's okay. Maybe that's Mini relative. Moog is like 1970. Yes. Yes. Okay, so this is, yes. The where, this is where it became. And, you know, those original modular ones that you're talking about, mm -hmm. they used to cost as much of a, as a car. Yes, they did. Yeah. And, and um, I've actually seen... You know, I play with Danny Carey. You know that I have you ever been to the, one of the shows with Danny Carey? Not yet. So anyway, he has Herbie Hancock's old modular synthesizer like that. Oh no. Sixty seven. I don't think it works. Oh no. But it's like a wow. wall worth of, of yes. synthesizer, you know. Yes. Um and they only can play one note at a time. Right. 
So yeah. I think in 70 is when the mini Moog comes out and this mm -hmm. really revolutionizes yes. uh, synthesis. Emerson had one. Yeah. You know, Joe's Joe's Almanol is our 2600, which was the big yes. competition for Moog. Yes. Well, I'll throw this in at you too. Um, it was, I think it was 67, 68 or no, 68, 69. Then Walter Carlos cut the album. Sure. Switch. Box. And, and, and that's it, mini moog yeah that's when they start really getting radical yeah yeah, yeah. that's what i caught on to it. yeah yeah if only i could play you know what i'm remembering like, now lv my trivia because i've written about this before the first use of a moog instrument i think is 68 jim morrison's vocals went through some kind of moog filter you got to be kidding. Which song? In 68. I don't know. What Doors album comes out in 68? Is that the first Doors album? I'll hunt it down. I but think it's I believe album. that is the first use of a Moog synthesizer on a Doors Love album. That's Love it. When I was researching it for something and read that somewhere. And it's in some article I wrote about synthesis somewhere. Man, that's great. Great, great. <laughs> oh, I just heard from our tech advisor, yes. uh, new tech administrator, and now she's playing our tech director, and a fabulous person I'm speaking of, Miss Jazzery Glenn, I mean, hey, she found out it was Waiting for the Sun. There you go. Thank you for that. We are a collaboration here. I like it. <laughs> I'm loving her more each day, I'm telling you, folks. Um, we're going through a transition at the station, and it's, I can see it's for the better. So, folks, watch Pasadena Media. They have a lot to share. Um, let's hear some, bringing back the Hammond world. Uh-huh. What are we going to hear from you? Okay, you know what? Let's listen to Time Changes, because I'm playing a, a very lovely A100 organ, which is a model a little bit after the Hammond B3. Um, some people prefer the Model A100 because they're a little newer and they're lighter, but the same inside. So this is oh, me. Yeah. This is me playing an A100 with the uh, my New York City trio, which is Ari Honig on drums and Gilad Hexelman on guitar. And this is called Time Changes. Let's hear Time Changes. <laughs> I saw it as a young man, and down through the ages, I continued to write verse. I used that as a creative expression, but it also helped me through life because I could address 
certain issues, certain feelings, and certain appreciations. I'm a retired school psychologist, and helping people was my thing. After my stroke, when Meals on Wheels started, I was on the other end of the stick, so to speak, and uh, suddenly I realized I was there where those other people were. <laughs> My name is Julius Gaines, creative writer, poet, photographer. America, let's do lunch. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. Wow. Brown Charette doing that Hammond magic. Man, I tell you, <laughs> I just get so excited because I hear things not done regularly on a Hammond. I just don't hear it. Now, what inspired that particular piece? Man, you know, that was written quite a while ago, that piece of music. I would say it was written 20 years ago. Um these guys in this particular trio, their specialty is tricky time things in jazz. Time signatures that are happening over an already existing time signature that's different, going easily between time signatures that change. They're kind of specialists with this. So this is why I picked this particular piece of music to play with these guys, because that's kind of their wheelhouse. And you know, not everybody is into that. So, um, I would even say that my music is more simple now than it was then. Um, I would venture to say that it's always been there. It's just people like their comfort to escape and just like their easy spot. Mm -hmm. Then there are some of us who like to venture. I says, yeah, that's great. But there are some of us who say, hey, we like to get out of the box and explore uh -huh. around. And that's how things get discovered. Yeah. And it excites the palate, especially it opens doors. Maybe it may not fit for so-and-so, but there's always wow. someone else who would take that. So that's what I definitely love of your music, your, your, your pieces. I mean, your genius. I mean, it's all there. It's all there. Man. Okay. What are um, some projects you're working on right now? Well, I just recorded a solo, my third solo organ album for Steeplechase. I'm also going to, in a few weeks, record my second seller live album. So I've got two new albums in the next couple of years coming out. Um, I am going, I just got a place in LA in Venice beach. I'm moving in, going to be bi-coastal starting this month. And uh, I'm coming in to play a couple gigs with, uh, I'll be with Danny Carey, I think on the 28th and Doug Webb at the baked potato. And then on the 30th at the grape in Ventura, maybe I'll have a couple other LA gigs that last week. Um, in May, I'm going to be in April with Oz Noy, a great guitarist, and Anton Big, the, drum, uh, the drummer for the Late Night with David Letterman show. Then I'll play a couple other tours in Europe. I'll be in Europe basically the whole month of May, and then I'll be back here playing festivals in the summer. Welcome to the left coast. Man, yeah. I remember years ago, he said, I would love to move out there, and I says. I hope he does because well, yeah, we have great people out here, yeah. but to have Down Beats finest here oh, on the West Coast, man, I am well, one happy camper. Well, here it comes, LB. Larry well, Golding is there. He's an incredible organist. Many great. Yes, West he Coast is. Organists. Yes, Blades, he is. Joe Baggs. Yes. Yep. Lots of great guys. Yes, they are great guys. Terry Frank. Right. Mm-hmm. I got Brian Charette, so hey, these other guys are always welcome on this show, but I got Brian. Well, uh, listen, we have this demon called time. Okay. Do you have any? Do you have any words for the future, Brian Charette? Just don't give up. 
That's all. Just stay in one direction and don't give up and don't be a jerk and you can't lose. Loving that. How can the audience get in contact with you? BrianCharette.com is my website. And my Instagram and Facebook are both easy to remember. They're Pinch Brian with an I. Pinch Brian is my uh, mm-hmm. Facebook and Instagram. Got a lot of stuff there, all my gigs all the time. Pretty easy to find. Love it. What are you going to take the audience out with? Let's do, what else do we have? We have a Chris's Jazz Cafe. Let's do uh, Chris's Jazz Cafe. This is maybe the Alligator Boogaloo. The Alligator Boogaloo with the comparable Brian Charette taking us out. Folks, this has been another episode of Times Within. And I'll I see you in a couple I... weeks, LV. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll play at Jimmy with Jimmy in Pasadena that week. I take it. Oh, yes. Uh, and give Doug a shout too, man. And with that being said, folks, do tune in again when we come back with Sounds Within, and we will get Brian back somehow, some way. I'm going to hold them to that, folks. So <laughs> you, we'll see you then. Peace out. <laughs> Thank you.